Calling All Cars, a presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. San Francisco Police Calling All Cars, Henson All Cars, a robbery. Three men entered a house on Filbert Street, bound the occupants and got away with $25,000 worth of currency and jewelry. Go get them, that's all. of Rio Grande gasoline have been steadily increasing. Motorists everywhere are learning what police performance in Rio Grande cracked really means. Cracking produces a gasoline that averages 10 points higher in anti knox than gasolines which are not cracked. It separates the sluggish, slow-burning elements from the rich, powerful atoms so that the cracked gasoline that police, fire, and emergency equipment use is all vital, concentrated power. When you hear police, fire, or ambulance sirens screaming down the street, or when you listen to the thrilling stories in Calling All Cars, remember Rio Grande Crack is the preferred gasoline for this emergency equipment. And what a test for gasoline. The average police car takes seven times the abuse that you give your car. In one of the police departments served with Crack, their patrol cars average 78,000 miles per year. They operate at cruising speeds of five miles per hour up to 70 or 80 in an emergency. What a test for gasoline. Thousands of listeners to this program have become regular users of cracked gasoline because of the extra power and speed that this gasoline actually does give. If you enjoy this program, may we ask that tomorrow you give yourself the opportunity to enjoy police car performance in your car. Gentlemen, tonight we are honored to have as our guest speaker Mayor Angelo J. Rossi of San Francisco. We shall now transfer control to the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, where Mayor Rossi will speak from a dinner of police chiefs of the Bay Area. Mayor Rossi. who has been detained by extraordinarily heavy official duties, we introduce Sergeant McKee of the San Francisco Police. Sergeant McKee. <clears throat> On behalf of Mayor Rossi and Chief William J. Quinn of San Francisco, I am happy to welcome the broadcast calling all cars to Northern California. Pardon. <clears throat> The police chiefs of the San Francisco Bay Area are present here, and I believe, join with me in extending good wishes to the Rio Grande Oil Company for sponsoring this feature. This broadcast will give citizens a clear picture of the work peace officers are doing in combating crime, and more important, will point out the lesson that all of us engaged in police work know that crime does not pay. Tonight, we are to hear the story of the human monkey, a criminal case. Who's there? 
Be quiet. Who is it? What do you want? Quiet, I said. Everett, what's the matter? Quiet, lady. Go on those legs, Everett. Right. Burglar. Take that sheet off the bed. Why, how dare you? Don't you? Come on, don't be all night. Get going. That's swell. Okay, tie him up. Look here, man. My wife isn't well. She'll catch cold. Shut up. Tie him up, Barton. Yes, sir, I will. I'll tie him up good. I got the same trust. Good. Better go through the pockets of his clothes. Okay. All right, Claire, let's get at that safe. Come on, Mr. Stewart. You're going to open the safe for us. But look here. There's nothing in the safe, I assure you. Shut up. We know what we're doing. Now get in there. Switch on that light, pal. Now open her up. Come on, quit stalling. Well, you... You frightened me so I can't get it to work right. And no so what, man? You open that thing up, or I'll beat your brains out of this, you blackjack. Come on, pal. Cut the rough stuff. Now look here, Stuart. You know what I got in this can? No. What is it? Nitroglycerin. Oh. And here's the putty in the cap. Oh. Now you open that safe or I'll blow that door off and you with it. Well, uh, I'll try. Uh, let me see. Three over two. Nine. Then two. Uh, uh, yes. That's it. Ah, well, that's more like it. Here, boy, look over here. There ought to be something in the silver drawer here, sure enough. Don't touch that. There's a burglar alarm attached to it. Huh? Oh. Take him back in the bedroom while I empty the safe. Yes, sir. Okay, come on, you. Tie him up good. Don't you worry, I will. Sarah, what's the matter? Oh, I'm all right, Edward. What's she doing on the floor, young man? Uh, she fell off the bed. Oh, but how could you leave her there like that? Aren't you ashamed oh, of her? Oh, quit your belly ache. You're lucky we didn't bump her along. Oh, oh, man, man. Man. we're just squawking. I'll put you to sleep for good. Well, it's going to tie up. Yes, sir. Okay, I got everything that was in the safe. Well, let's go, then. Now, get this straight, you two. Don't move and don't make no noise. If you do, we'll come back and blow you to bits. <laughs> After a quarter hour of frantic calling, the two victims managed to rouse their young grandson who frees them from their bonds. Mr. Stewart discovers that the telephones in the house have been ripped from the walls. And it's another half hour before he can, he can awaken a neighbor and summon the police. Shortly afterwards, Detective Sergeants George McLaughlin and Leo Bunner of the robbery squad inspect the scene of the crime. George, it looks as though this is the window they got in by. Yep, that's right. Here's the mark of the chimney. About an inch and three quarters wide. Yeah, uh, probably one of them was boosted through this window and opened the door for the others. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, yes, I... Got any sort of a burglar alarm system here? Why, yes. The whole first floor is wired with burglar alarm. Hmm, that's funny. It's a sense they got in by this window, but no alarm went off. I wonder if they shorted the system. Try that window over there, George. Okay. Uh, no short. Well, let's get a look at this thing. Just as I thought. Look here, George. Now, what do you find? See this? When I raise the window, this alarm doesn't click. The window shrunk a bit, see? Uh, sure. But the alarm works on the other windows. I'll say it does. Just listen to it. Uh, it looks like an inside job to me. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Yes? Now, let me get the straight of this again. You say that one of the men went directly to the pocket on the inside of your vest for your bankroll, huh? Yes, that's right. Well, do many people know that you carry your money there? Why, no, naturally not. And they knew where the safe was and about the burglar alarm in the silver drawer. Yes. Uh, it's all very strange. Uh, not so strange, Mr. Stewart. This job was pulled off by someone on the inside. What do you mean? How many servants do you have? Two. A Chinese cook and a housemaid. Uh, either of them could have been in on this. Oh, I'm sure to be fool. Why, he's been with me for nearly four years. Uh, how about the houseman? Uh, no, I can't be so sure. There. I've had, uh, let me see, three different housemen in the past few months. You'd better give us a description of them. Well, uh, first, there was uh, Percy Randolph. Percy Randolph? Yes. Negro, about six feet tall, slow-spoken, scar on the left temple? Why, yes, that's the man. But I'm sure he had nothing to do with this thing. He had impeccable references. Worked for a uh, Dr. Wilson in Stockton before he came here. Well, why did you discharge him? I didn't. He quit for a better job in a garage just down the street here. But I'm sure he's on it. Well, I wouldn't be too sure, Mr. Stewart. Because Percy Randolph is an ex-convict who hasn't been out of San Quentin much more than a year. Good heavens. Come on, Leo. Let's go around to this garage and get a line on Percy. Percy's employer at the garage informs the detectives that Percy has been ill for a couple of days and directs them to his address in Oakland. Early the next afternoon, the two detectives take the ferry across the bay. 
McLaughlin, wise to the ways of the man they are seeking, suggests to his partner that they first look into a few of the restaurants in the Black Belt. In the second place visited, the officers find a party of several Negroes and their ladies. Percy is among those present. That's him. The tall, bullet-headed one. Come on, let's talk to him. Hello, Percy. Hello. Hello. We want to see you outside for a minute. Yeah, there. Yeah. Sure no. Who you want to talk to my boy, man? Just got a few questions to ask him. Well, you can't take my boy from me. Hey, how's your mouth, Rose? Man, these gentlemen know what they're doing. Now, just a minute, I get my hat. Oh, you won't need your hat. You only want to talk to me for a couple of minutes. Yeah, but I guess I better take it, boss. I don't think I'll be back for a long, long time. Hey, what's this all about, honey? They don't mind yourself once a bell rose, man. Oh, yeah, you're coming back sometime, isn't you, big boy? I don't know, honey. You all see me when you all see me. These two gentlemen didn't come all this way over the bay here for nothing. Uh-uh. His quick surrender bespeaks a guilty conscience. His replies to the various questions shot at him are so evasive and contradictory that the officers are convinced he is lying. Finally, after hours of questioning, he suddenly offers to come through if they will buy him a swell dinner. McLaughlin and Bunner jump at the offer and rapidly escort Percy to a quiet little Italian restaurant on Montgomery Street. And there, after a huge dinner, the Negro consents to talk. Well, you see, it was this way, I've got a friend, a colored boy, who lives over on Pine Street. What's his name? Uh, Bob. Hmm? Go ahead. Well, I used to drop around and see him have a shot of gin, see? And one night while I was there, a couple of white boys come in. Now, what are their names? I don't know. I never I never done heard them say. Sure about that? Yes, sir. I was positive. Okay, go ahead. Well, sir, these boys was pretty broke, and they was figuring on how to make some dough quick and easy. So in a while, Barton tells them that I used to work for Mrs. Stewart and that they could knock them over easy if I helped them on the job. Well, sir, I didn't want to mess around Mr. Stewart's place. You know, he was always on the level with me. Well, why did you then? Well, I'm not saying I did, and I'm not saying I didn't. What happened next? Well, they, they, they all set to work on me, see? And finally, I agreed to tell them about the place, and they said that I'd better keep out of the way. But just the same, they're going to split with me. So, you see, I really didn't have anything to do with the actual robbery. Yeah, I can see that. Where's your share of the take? Mine? Oh, I ain't got that yet. Hey, Sergeant, that reminds me. Reminds you of what? What time was it? Uh, a few minutes past nine. Why? Well, sir, I've got a date with, with, with Barton at ten. Yeah, yeah. Why didn't you say so? Well, I just plumb forgot all about it. What are you doing, Percy? Hand us a line? No, sir, that's the gospel truth. I had to meet him with Sutter and Lyon at ten o'clock to get my cut. Okay. We'll soon find out if you're telling the truth or not, Percy. We'll take you to the corner of Sutter and Lyon at 10 o'clock and let you meet Barton. But we'll have our guns on you every minute, and if you try to make any funny business, you'll never live to remember it. Percy is instructed by the officers to meet Barton and walk east on Sutter Street. Bunner hides across Sutter Street in the shadow of a porch. McLaughlin hides in an alley. Several other officers are placed out of sight around the corner. And a block away, two men wait in a police car. Bunner watches the radium dial of his watch as 10 o'clock approaches. Still suspecting that Percy had been handing him a line, the detective is amazed to see a Negro carrying a suitcase, a light from a Sutter Street car at exactly one minute past 10. Barton starts walking west. And Bunner is about to pull his gun when Percy hails his friend and Barton comes toward him. For a few minutes, the two men talk. And then Barton gives Percy the suitcase and places something in his hand. Just at that moment, a police car drives by and Barton, frightened, hastily leaves Percy. Bunner, unlimbering his gun, rides along in the shadows on the other side of the street, keeping parallel with Barton. When the Negro is under a street light, Bunner runs across the street, keeping the bandit covered. Pick up your hands and stay right where you are. Well, you won't walk. You're under arrest. Won't fall. I ain't done nothing. If you know what's good for you, you'll keep quiet, boy. Got him covered, Neil? Sure. Slap the bracelets on him. Huh? Take him down. Hey, Tim, bring Percy down here. Okay, sir. Find anything? Yeah. yeah a couple of hundred dollars in ten and twenty dollar gold pieces. Uh, gold pieces, huh? That's probably part of the Stuart loot. Hey, here's Percy, Sergeant. Fine. Once you get that 
suitcase, Buzzy. Yeah, I did, yeah. Phil, uh, he'll give it to me. Miss Blackbar's lying. She I never saw him before. Shut up. Open the suitcase, Buzzy. Yeah. Oh. yeah, there you are, sir. Uh-huh. Two of clothes and two towels with Stuart's name on them. Where'd you get these, Barton? I ain't enough. Well, maybe I'll change your tune when we get you to headquarters. <laughs> Barton steadfastly refuses to talk. And when arraigned before the judge next day, proclaims his innocence and demands an immediate trial. Officers Bunner and McLaughlin ask for more time to enable them to round up two more suspects. And the judge continues the case for a week, placing Barton under a $100,000 bond. Then McLaughlin and Bunner are led by Percy to Barton's room on Pine Street. While McLaughlin and the Negro hide in Barton's room, Bunner interviews the Japanese landlady. Yes, please. I'm a police officer. Oh, police officer. Oh, I nothing do bad. I good woman. What for the honorable police officer come to my house? Oh, don't worry, ma'am. I didn't come here to arrest you. Oh, very nice. Thank you very much. I want to ask you some questions. Oh, yes. Questions. I do. I want to know something about that colored fellow that lives upstairs. Oh, sir. Color fellow. He not uh, nice, I think. Any white men go up there? White men? Oh, I think maybe yes. What do you know about them? Me? Not knowing anything. Well, how many men were there? Oh, maybe so, too. Sometime other kind of fellow, he come, I think. What do they do up there? They do, I... I not know him. Now, listen, ma'am, I'm not going to arrest you. I want to find out about these guys. Now, what do they do up there? Oh, please, they talk. Maybe they drink. What do they talk about? I know nothing. I hear voices. Oh, maybe so. There comes one of them through door. Where? Come in from street, maybe. Get back in the room. Close that door part way. I don't want him to see me. Ah, that one of white man. That's fine. Oh, why you pull gun? Maybe you shoot him? Maybe if I have to. You stay right here and don't make any noise. Oh, yes. Please, yes. Remember, quiet. Oh, yes. I'm not forgetting. Oh, I beg your pardon. I guess I'm in the wrong room. That's the right room, all right. Get back in there. I was looking for my girl. There's a couple of men in there. Don't argue with me. Get back in there. What's the matter? Don't you know your old pal Percy anymore? Say, who are you anyway? You don't recognize me yet, huh? Well, I'm a police officer. Come on out here, George, and search this guy. Oh, Say, what's this all about? That's what we're finding out. Know this guy, Percy? Sure, boss. He was on the steward job. His name is Elmer Sandberg. Your memory's getting better, Percy. Ah, uh, you're crazy. My name's George Smith. Yeah, I know. We got a lot of your relatives on our books. And here you are, Leo. Ten dollar gold piece is all I can find. No gun? Nope. Well, the gold piece linked him up with the steward job. Yeah, but he was there, boss. Shut up, you dirty stool pigeon. All right, Sandberg, you shut up. That sort of thing isn't going to help you any. Yeah, look here. I'm on the level, I tell you. I don't know what this is all about. Oh, well, then I'll tell you. Night before last, $25,000 in bonds, jewelry, and cash were stolen from Everett Stewart's house on Filbert Street. We want to know what you know about it. Well, I don't know nothing about then it. Then why were you eager to call Percy a stool pigeon? Oh, I know these kind of guys. He'd frame anybody for two bucks. Oh, come on, Sanford. Let's save some time. What have you got to tell us about this stick-up? I got nothing to tell. Listen, why don't you take him into the room alone, Leo? We're just wasting time this way. Okay, I'll try it. Come on in here, Elmer. I want to talk to you alone. I suppose you're locking that door so you can give me the works, huh? Not at all. I just want you to tell me the truth. Now, well, I am telling you the truth. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, yes, you do. I suppose it's natural that you'd lie, but it'll save us all a lot of time if you'll come clean and tell me all you know about that store. Yeah, I holder. tell you, I don't know anything. Well, how about that gold piece we found in your pocket? There's a lot of gold in that store, Paul. Well, it's a, a birthday present for my girl. Oh, come on, Sanford. That's weak as the devil. We'll have to think of a better story than that. Uh, look here, Sergeant. I'm I'm awfully thirsty. How about a drink of water? Well, there isn't any in here in this room. Well, there's a tap at the end of the hall, eh? Uh, will you talk if I get you some water? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll ask George to get you some. Just wait till I unlock this door. As Sergeant Bunner turns his back to unlock the door, he hears a scuffle of feet and whirls around to find that his prisoner has dived head first through the window. Rushing to the window, Bunner faces Sandman for a brief instant across the fire escape. And then the daredevil bandit hurls himself into space. 
horror-stricken runner watches Sandman's body turn over and over as he falls three stories onto a vacant lot beside the rooming house. Sounding the alarm to McLaughlin, Bunner runs down the fire escape. When he reaches the second floor landing, to his amazement, he sees Sandbridge jump to his feet and run toward Pine Street. Bunner jumps from the second floor landing. His ankle crumples under him as he hits the ground. McLaughlin, rounding the side of the building, cannot shoot at Sandburn because his brother officer is in the line of fire. This momentary break enables Sandburn to escape from the crowds on Pine Street. And discouraged, the two officers, Bunner limping badly, climb the stairs to the room where the frightened Percy waits for them. They begin a careful search of the room as they discuss their hard luck. Leg hurt much, Leo? Yeah, be bad. I broke something when I lit. Yeah, but that's nothing. But what I can't understand is how that guy can move after he jumped those three stories. Yeah, beats me. Well, we just got a tough break, that's all. Yeah, that's right. Hey, George. Here's something. What do you got? An address. Here, what do you make of it? Hmm. 116 E-U-R-L-E Street. Ah, what a lousy penman this guy is. Earl Street. There's no street like that in San Francisco. Uh, wait a minute. This may not be an E, and this L-E might be a K, which might make it Turk Street. That's right. And 116 is just around the corner. Let's give 116 Turk Street a try. Two detectives, accompanied by Percy, hurry to the Turk Street address as quickly as Bonner's injured leg will permit. As they enter the place, they overhear the tail end of an argument. I tell you, this ain't no escaping house. I won't have you setting up the place. If you're going to come in here all telling with black you have to get out and stay out. Hey, wait a minute. This sounds interesting. And that's funny. Sounds like the landlady's reading a riot act to somebody. Quiet. Here she comes. Well. What do you want? Now, we're looking for a young kid who might be injured. Did anybody like that come in here during the past few minutes? Did he? I'll say he did. And he's going out as fast as he come in. Said he was run over by an automobile. <laughs> I don't believe him. And I don't want the police coming around my place. Madam, we are the police. I knew it. I knew that young devil would get me in trouble. Please, please be quiet. We don't want to tip him off. Uh, let's go into your apartment and talk it over. Oh, very well. But I can tell you right now, I don't know anything about this. I run a respectable place here. There's no doubt about that, ma'am, but let's not make so much noise. Which is your apartment? Oh, this one right here. I suppose we'll have to let you come in. Yeah, leave the door slightly open. We don't want him to get away. Is this the only way out of the house? Yes, it is. What's this fellow look like? Well, he's about 17. He's short. He's got gray eyes. How badly injured is he? He's all scratched up and he's nipping. He told me he'd call his uncle to take him to the hospital. His uncle? Yes, there's a middle-aged man comes to see him. At least he says it's his uncle. Now, wait a minute. Did you hear that? Yes. That was somebody coming in the front door. If it's this boy's uncle, nod to me. All right. That's him. Drop your hands. What? Quiet, I'll let you have it. I'll get back in here. Frisk him, George. Hey, what is this? I came here to get a good night's sleep. Yeah? Well, you'll get your good night's sleep tonight in jail. No gas, Leo. Good. I'll get into this closet here. Hey, look here. You can't do this. And to shut me. up. <coughs> See, that's Frank Leatherman. We've set him up a couple of times for safe cracking. We're doing a good day's work, Leo. Yeah, but we haven't got Sandburn yet. <laughs> Letterman and Percy are sent back to headquarters with the traffic officer while Bunner and McLaughlin call for reinforcements to surround the block. The posse arrives and McLaughlin secretes himself in a closet which has a window that gives out into an areaway and commands a view of the window to Sandburn's room. All precautions taken, Bunner approaches the door of the room and is surprised to see it open and Sandburn appear. The game's up, Elmer. You better give yourself up. We don't want to harm you. For answer, Sandburn slams the door in the detective's face. And McLaughlin, from his point of vantage, sees the human monkey crawl out of the window and begin climbing hand over hand up a drain pipe toward the roof. McLaughlin leans out the window. Come down there, Sanborn. We've got you covered. Ah, not for you and your police force. In an attempt to frighten Sanborn, McLaughlin throws out his automatic. But Sanborn continues climbing. Just as he nears the roof, the detective fires again. This time, neatly drilling each of the fugitive's legs. But this does not stop Sanborn. And with a tremendous heave, he disappears over the ledge onto the roof. 
A moment later, Detective Nielsen runs in and reports that Sandburn, attempting to climb higher to the roof of the adjoining building, had gained the eaves, and losing his grip, had fallen three stories. Sure that he was dead, Nielsen had descended to the spot in time to see this amazing young fellow crawl through the window into a hotel. The detectives now concentrate their search in the hotel and methodically go through every floor, room by room. As they reach the second floor, the manager rushes up to them. Officers, officer, come quickly. Come quickly. He's in my kitchen. Uh, Hurry. Which way? Right down the hall here in 205. There. In there. Drop that gun, Sandman, and we'll let you have it. Okay. You're got me all right. We oh, fainted. Come on, boys. Let's carry him out to the car. Yeah. Yeah. Get all right. Feet down, yeah. Just get him. Take it easy. easy. Oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah, all right. This way. Hold that door open, Charlie. Well, look at the way that poor kid's been beaten up by those big brutes. Get that, George? Yeah, yeah, I got it. The policeman's hold us in the wrong with some people. Yeah, I wonder if that dame would like to have this poor kid bump her on the floor some night the way he did Mrs. Stewart. Sanborn's apartment, police find two containers of nitroglycerine, fuses, caps, and four big automatics. A checkup at the Bureau of Identification quickly reveals that all four men implicated in the Stewart robbery have criminal records. They are speedily brought to trial and speedily found guilty of first-degree robbery, Sanborn and Barton being sentenced to San Quentin for from one to 15 years, and Letterman for one year to life. When Judge Ward is considering Percy Randolph's sentence, McLaughlin and Bunner visit him in his chambers. Yes, gentlemen, what can I do for you? Judge, uh, we came to see you about this Randolph case. Yes? Well, Judge, we'd like to ask a little consideration for this fellow. He was a great help to us in getting the other three men. And he turned state's evidence in the trial, you know. Yes, I know. I think he's learned his lesson, Judge. I think he'll go straight from now on. Hmm. You have more confidence in human nature than I have. What do you want me to do about him? Well, if I were you, I'd release him on probation. I don't like to do that. Well, George and I will find him a job. I'm sure he's on the level now. <laughs> well, boys, I think you're wrong. But since you ask it, if you can find him a job, I'll release him on probation. Oh, gee, that's swell, Judge. But there's just one thing. What's that, sir? I'll bet you Percy Randolph will be back before the court in six months' time. <laughs> and Bunner obtain a job for Percy in a cleaning plant. He went straight for several months and then one day disappeared with a truckload of clothes. He was arrested in San Jose and in just one day less than six months after the prediction he stood before Judge Ward and heard his sentence reversed and was soon crossing the bay to join his pals in San Quentin. <laughs> When you hear police sirens screaming, remember that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is saving precious seconds in police car emergencies. In many cities where Rio Grande is sold, the police departments have officially selected cracked gasoline because competitive tests have proved that this gasoline gives them extra power and extra speed for all kinds of emergencies. This extra power is created by the Rio Grande cracking process, which breaks up the atoms of crude oil making a finer, better gasoline. In uncracked gasolines, this energy is wasted. So you actually do get extra power and speed when you use Rio Grande cracked gasoline in your car. You get police car performance, and it costs you nothing extra because Rio Grande cracked, with tetraethyl added, sells for no more than many gasolines which are not made by the cracking process. You get a greater value for your money when you drive into an independent service station and ask for cracked gasoline.
San Francisco Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 42 regarding a holdup. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Produced by William N. Robeson. The orchestra is conducted by Frederick Stark. Your narrator.